you know, you go to bed at night and everything seems to be okay. And then you wake up to ca almost like chaos. In this Sankofa segment, you'll hear from a family that lived through one of Cleveland's defining historical events, the summer of 66, when Huff burned. Huff was like downtown. They had anything you wanted was up on Huff. But then you're gonna refuse to, to serve the people that live in the, in the neighborhood? That's not fair. It's not right. This is the African-American Cultural Gardens Sankofa series. We look back so that we can move forward. If you drive through the Huff neighborhood today, there are not very many reminders of what happened here in July of 1966. But the people who lived through it, like members of the Yarborough family, still have vivid memories. I remember um, looking out the bathroom window at night and the sky was orange because of the fires, okay? Uh, the National Guard driving down the street in these huge, I thought they were tanks, maybe they weren't that big, but you know, being a kid, and that was out of the norm. And just not really knowing what it was all about. On the evening of July 18th, 1966, a black man asked the white owner of a bar on East 79th and Huff for a glass of water. The owner reportedly used the N-word and refused. Soon, a crowd gathered outside and began throwing rocks at the bar. That began six days of violence that left four people dead, about 30 injured, and 300 arrested. 240 fires were set that did more than a million dollars in property damage and leveled what had been a thriving business district. Mayor Ralph Loker called in the National Guard. It's been called the Huff Riot, but many historians and activists like Don Freeman, who lived through that time, reject that characterization. Let's talk about the Huff Rebellion, not riots. You can see more of Don Freeman's interview in another Sankofa segment. He and others argue that what exploded in Huff in 1966 had been building up for years. There had been a rapid change in the population from white to black in the 50s, as blacks moved here from the South for better jobs. Johnny Yarborough Sr.'s brother was the first black person to buy a house on Crawford Road in 1947. Once neighbors realized the house had been sold to a black man, some tried to buy it back. By having the name Yarborough, they thought he was white. <laughs> and they tried to buy the house from him. He said a white guy came down, wanted to buy the house back. He said, we don't want no blacks on the, on the, on the street. He told him, I didn't buy it to sell. I bought it to live in it, and I'm going to live here. Many blacks in Huff lived in overcrowded, substandard housing, and they were often overcharged for necessities by whites who owned the neighborhood businesses. However, the Yarboroughs were a stable, middle-income family. They did not participate in the revolt, but they experienced the results. And then I remember my mother taking us, we would walk down every day to see the damage that they had done. And a lot of the buildings were half burned. You know, there was a lot of looting going on. You know, it was a scary time because we lived, we were always, I felt we were always safe in our home. Did the Huff violence and its aftermath convince the Yarboroughs to leave? You'll hear what they decided. But first, this Sankofa episode is part of the African-American Cultural Gardens education series as we're raising funds to finish building the garden. Hello everyone, I'm Leon Bibb. The African-American Cultural Garden, one of the many cultural gardens on Martin Luther King Drive, celebrates the African-American experience. Part of the garden is already completed on the upper level. It represents the past with the door of no return. You can walk between the black granite walls and imagine the fearful experience of those taken from Africa in tight quarters on slave ships. This is Danita Harris from News 5. What has not been built yet is a channel for water that cascades down the hill, representing the Middle Passage on the Atlantic Ocean. 
It leads to a black granite terrace that will host events. It is etched with the Little Dipper and the North Star, which guided thousands of enslaved people to freedom in the North. I'm Wayne Dawson. The water will continue to flow down the hillside in reference to the Ohio River and the Great Lakes that facilitated the journey to a better life. It also marks the continued struggle of black people to the present. The garden will end at Martin Luther King Drive. The entire structure will symbolize the spirit and tremendous resilience of our parents, grandparents, and great-grandparents who came from the South to a better life in the North. This is Harry Boomer. The future platform beside the MLK Boulevard's walking trail will have benches and a water feature that gives homage to our past and hope to our future generations that anything is possible regardless of the challenges. This is Obi Shelton. Let's finish it. The African American Cultural Garden has a portion already built at the top of the hill. With your help, it will cover the entire hill as a magnificent tribute to those who came before us, as well as a symbol of pride and hope for future generations. We need your donations of money, time, and energy to make it happen. Everybody can contribute something. We can do it. Click the support button to get involved. Let's finish it. Today in Huff, there remain many vacant lots where businesses burned in 1966. But there are also many expensive homes built in the late 80s and 90s. As far as businesses, the thriving district has never been rebuilt. So they burned those businesses down the question I started to ask as I got older, now what? You burned down the businesses that we used, now what? Alyssa Foster lived next to the Yarboroughs. Many of my mother's friends and others that had lived in the neighborhood, neighbors, they moved out, some of them, and asked my mother, well, Chris, Aren't you going to move? She said, why should I leave? We're staying right here. I didn't have no, no mind of moving. I told people that were moving from here, I said, if you move and go to the Heights or wherever you go, you're going to run into the same property you got here. Johnny Yarborough still lives in the same house on Crawford Road where his family lived in 1966. His son, Tramel lives within walking distance. The family can go back to the corner where the uprising started. It's a vacant lot now. And think about what impact that week in 1966 has had on Huff and Cleveland today. I just remember like the resurgence of things like the Stokes and being involved in, you know, working in the community to help get him elected because that was a big deal, you know. About a year and a half after the Huff uprising, Carl Stokes was elected the first black mayor of a major city. Joanne Yarbrough and Alyssa Foster say they were energized as young teens. What do I know about politics at that age? Nothing. But we are out there with them in the rain and passing out flyers and telling people to vote. So yes, it was good. Yes, it was positive. But yes, it was negative because now if I gotta go to store, I gotta travel four miles. It's taken a long time for something good to come out of it, I think. I do think um, the community learned how to really decide to try to make some changes themselves instead of other people coming into our neighborhood to make changes, even though it's, some of that is still going on. It was a wild experience to me to having lived through that when I think about it now. We hope this Sankofa segment has given you a broader and richer understanding of the history of black Americans in Greater Cleveland. More interviews are on our Sankofa series, available on the YouTube channel, African American Cultural Gardens, and our website, aaacg.org. <laughs>